So can we start? Yep. Thank, you. thank you so much, first of all, obviously, for letting us present. It's always nice to be able to talk to pre-med students about this. Um, so, Yona, do you, do you want me to start this off? Yeah, sure. Okay, so again, I'm sure Yona may have introduced himself already, but um, that's Yona. He is a third-year podiatric medical student. I'm also a third-year podiatric medical student, and I'm Diksha. And together, uh, we've created the DPM Journey, which is a YouTube channel and an Instagram where we teach and educate people about podiatric medicine because back when we were pre-meds and we were thinking about podiatry, there wasn't much out there. And I know people tend to connect more when they, when they hear from students or podiatrists themselves. And so we wanted to fill in that gap and make sure people don't go through what we went through because it, it took a lot of searching and asking different podiatrists out there my, ourselves. And so, yeah, so let's start. So a podiatrist, oh, let me move this over. Podiatrist is a physician or a surgeon who treats the foot and ankle and related structures of the lower extremities. So what podiatric physicians do, how do I minimize this? There you go. Okay, um, so podiatrists treat a wide variety of symptoms and conditions that patients have. So the patients they treat can range from pediatrics to geriatrics and athletes to diabetic patients. So basically, we see a lot of different kinds of patients all the time. So podiatrists, uh, they can provide immediate relief to patients for their pain or discomfort, and they build rapport with their patients pretty quickly because we treat the same patients from diagnosis through treatment, surgery, and recovery. So that's one of my personal favorite parts about podiatry. I love being able to have a relationship with all my patients uh, rather than just see them out quickly. We do have those kind of relationships as well with our patients because some of them just need quick, quick treatment options, but yeah. And then uh, yeah, so many of us enjoy a healthy work-life balance, working about 40 to 60 hours in a week and earning just as much as their other physician peers. However, you can decide. That's another beautiful thing about podiatry and honestly, a lot of other healthcare fields. You can decide what you want out of your career. So again, like I said, we treat a lot of different conditions, but some of them are bunions foot pain, nail care, ulcers, wounds, fractures, nerve-related conditions, and so much more. But we, what I like to say is we literally treat everything that's related to the foot and ankle that you could possibly think of. So we can pursue surgery, sports medicine, dermatology, pediatrics, wound care, diet. So we can practice in a hospital. A lot of podiatrists have private practices. Uh, they can work in their emergency room, urgent trauma care facilities, sports teams, VA hospitals for veterans, right? Um, and podiatrists work with other medical professionals. So what I mean by that is obviously uh, for a lot of insurances, for example, or in certain states, um, you would have to first see your PCP, right? Your general physician, family physician uh, first and tell them about what you're going through. And then they will send you to a podiatrist. They'll refer you to a podiatrist. So that's one way. Another way is we work with vascular surgeons pretty closely if someone has something wrong with their vascular issues. So there's that and so much more. So Oh, oh, and orthopedic surgeons is something, obviously. Uh, we work with them closely as well. Sometimes if there's a case uh, that they're working on and then they're, they find out their patient, they're, they have other patients who need something that's related to the foot and ankle, then they would send them to us or we would just go back and forth with them about different options. So yeah, we're, we're constantly working with different medical professionals. Yona, is this where you start or should I? 
Yeah, I could take it over from here. Okay. okay, so when you enter podiatric medical school, you actually go through four years of medical school, which a lot of people are not aware of. Um, and during those first two years of medical school, you actually take didactic classes such as biochemistry, physiology, and human anatomy, in addition to lower extremity specific courses like podiatric medicine courses, podiatric surgery courses. So we have a lot to do during those four years. Oh, during those uh, first two years. And then during your second and third years, you actually go through clinical training where you actually go through clinical rotations um, around respective hospitals around that area so you can get more clinical training that way. And then during your fourth year, you actually have one year of externships, which is basically visiting a residency for about one month and then showing them if you're the right fit for the residency program and showing them your skills if you're able to actually fit in with that program. And then after four years of medical school, you actually do three years of residency and residency is actually surgical. So every podiatrist trains to become a surgeon. So no matter what, you can't avoid being a surgeon. You have to be a surgeon, but that doesn't mean you have to be training. You don't, ha you don't have to do surgery after residency. You can just stay as a normal podiatrist who does clinical care. And then after three years of residency, there is an optional one to two years of fellowship and fellowships include trauma, sports medicine, um, wound care, so much more. There's a lot out there. And to add to, add to that, uh, we also, so during those three years of residency, we're literally working side by side with all of the other residents who aren't doing podiatry, non-podiatry residents, because any resident at all in this country, um, they all have similar requirements their first few years. So that's why we work alongside um, MD and DO residents. Okay. There you go. Okay, perfect. Um, so applications are accepted on a rolling basis. So the earlier you apply, the better it is for your chances. Also, um, if you apply earlier, a lot of schools have a separate scholarship pool of money for students. So if you apply early and you get accepted, you are more likely to uh, be considered for a scholarship versus other students who apply later and get accepted. So it's better that you apply early. And then 99% of podiatry students after graduating are ultimately placed in a residency program. And that is due to the fact that there is actually a surplus of residencies out there for podiatry students. So I haven't heard of one podiatry student who actually hasn't gotten to a residency program. So requirements. Um, again, we actually take, we have to take the MCAT and a lot of people actually don't know about that, but yes, you have to. So the average MCAT score for prospective students is around 500. Our ab average uh, GPA, Cumulative is 3.3, and our average science GPA is around a 3.2. And of course, you have to have eight semester hours in the following science courses, biology, chemistry, organic chemistry, and physics. A lot of guys who are pre-med, you guys, we all have to go through the same course. So um, for me, I never felt that um, applying to DPM was going to be a harder course versus applying to MDDO. I actually applied to all three because all of them had actually the same requirements. Um, the only additional thing I would say was letters of recommendation. You, I think eight out of the nine score, schools, it's mandatory to actually shadow podiatrists and get a letter of recommendation from, from a podiatrist. And that's just due to the fact that you're going to a very specialized schooling. So they want to see if you're really interested in pursuing such a career. And then there's a personal interview. And just to add on again you want you want to be able to shadow as well i why don't i felt like i had that in here but you you definitely should shadow because again this is a specialty right you want to know for sure that this is something that you're interested in and something that's important is being able to discuss it during your interview because you will be asked almost, I can almost guarantee it, uh, why you didn't pursue another healthcare field. Because with MDDO, you have the choice of 
going back through residency if you decided to change your specialty, okay? But with podiatry, once you're done with your residency and your fellowships, if you decide to do a fellowship, you can't go back and say, oh, I'm going to be a cardiologist now. You can't do that as of yet, unfortunately. Uh, you would still have to go back and apply to MDDO schools. So that's why you want to know for sure that this is what you want to do. And the only way you could really figure that out is through shadowing. Um, and I don't know if I finished what I was saying, but when you're, when you're getting interviewed, they will ask you, why not any other healthcare specialty? Why not MDDO? And why do you like podiatry so much? So make sure you know that very well and get to know your podiatrist that you're shadowing so that they can write a good letter of recommendation for you. So there are nine schools. So there's not a lot of schools and uh, just there's a list of them here. There's one in Arizona, one in Florida, Miami, one in Cal California, which is in NorCal. There's actually one in NorCal, which is where we're at, which is around Oakland, San Francisco area. And then there's one down south in SoCal, which is Western University of Health and Science. That's also a DO program as well. And they take classes with DO students. There is Kent State, New York College of Podiatric Medicine, Shoal, and Temple. And I believe Shoal, Diksha, is the one that they t take classes with MD students. And then there was one other one as well. Yeah, that there's was... also Midwestern takes it with DO students as well. Where's... Oh yeah, there's Midwestern, yeah. yeah. Okay, Often. perfect. Okay. So why podiatry? So again, like I said before, all podiatric medical students are trained as surgeons from day one through our curriculum and by being required to complete a three-year surgical residency upon graduation from podiatric medical school, which is really awesome. Um, I know a lot of pre-meds or students who are going to uh, medical school, a lot of them want to be surgeons. So this is a guaranteed way to actually become a surgeon if you are looking into uh, becoming a surgeon one day. It's very stress-free. Again, a lot of podiatrists have work 40 to 60 hours per week and actually have a great work-life balance. And that's one of the things that we pride ourselves in. And it's, and with that being said, we're, we're usually not on call, which is a really nice thing about our profession. I mean, if you want to go into the trauma sort of aspect of things for podiatry, you can definitely be on call. You can definitely be on call for those types of surgeries, but usually podiatrists are usually in clinical care and they do surgeries as needed if uh, the situation calls for it. Uh, we see positive results really fast. Um, a lot of people, uh, don't know that we we practice conservative care a lot of the time. We actually don't jump the gun in actually doing surgery. And I think conservative care is one of those things that actually allows us to see all these positive results and build a repertoire with patients. And that brings me to the fifth point, we develop personal relationships. Again, a lot of these people who we see as well are diabetics and diabetics need uh, care over time for a long period of time. And that's why we develop these personal relationships with them. And we know all about their lives and what they're like and it's really it's really nice to see that in our profession and we're we have the ability to specialize in its subspecialties yes podiatry is a specialty in itself but like i said before there's a lot of fellowship programs where you can subspecialize in sports medicine rear rear foot and hind uh, rear foot and forefoot reconstruction a lot of these things that you can subspecialize that will make you even better at what you're doing as a podiatrist and ultimately at the end of the day you are a visit phys physician uh, you are a doctor, and um, a lot of people think, oh, we're not really certified doctors. No, we're not. We, oh, we are. We go through four years of medical school, three years of uh, surgical residency, and then we actually have to do an additional two to three years of uh, accumulating a lot of surgeries under our belt to take a board-certified test to become ultimately board-certified for our profession. So it's you're looking at around a 10-year process of becoming a really certified podiatrist. And again, I just like to add on to what Jonas is saying. Um, we, uh, so of course, like he was saying, you can normally from what people see, podiatrists do normally have 
you could choose to have a stress-free time in your practice. Then I was talking to the doctor that I'm, uh, we're, during, we're having our rotations right now because um, at our school, we start off our second year. So while we're balancing our second year classes, we're also in clinic, but um, the rotation I'm at right now, it's a private office rotation. And I'm with a doctor who was telling me she's been in practice for over 20 years. So she was saying, of course, what she wanted in her life was uh, a stress-free practice, right? But even though her practice is stress-free, she also handles different clinics and she's a very, uh, she's someone who's like an entrepreneur and she's very into that. So because of that, she's constantly at work. She's constantly working. And then there are the podiatrists who enjoy enjoy a, an adrenaline rush. And so those are the ones that are doing trauma and that sort of thing or something related to that, or they're on call, or they're called what, like 3 a.m. in the morning or something. Those do exist, but primarily podiatrists usually choose to work in clinic and just have a nine to five kind of job. Okay, so that's the end of our presentation. I wanted to make it quick for you guys. Uh, we wanted to make it quick for you guys. So if you guys have any questions, shoot away. We're happy to answer any questions for you guys. Yeah, I'm sure we missed a few things, so. And guys, don't be shy. We, uh, the last time we've had a presentation, there's a lot of students to ask us a lot of questions. So whatever comes into your mind, just ask away. Again, we get all different sorts of questions about the MCAT, about schooling, about living situation. So just if you have anything that com comes into mind, you should ask now while we're present here. Um, this is a very general question, but um, what advice would you have for like a high school student who's interested in this idea of like medical school? That's a that's a great question. And um, we actually talked to a high school program about this. And I would say, because it's COVID right now, I would say, try to call up a podiatrist or Skype a podiatrist. And because again, they're not podiatrists, they're not really allowing uh, students to shadow right now, but it's considered virtual virtual shadowing if you Skype them. So I would say definitely Skype a podiatrist and ask them a bunch of questions to see what their life is like and to see what they're doing in their daily life. Because I think you can sort of get a full sense of what the profession entails from that podi podiatrist perspective. And you shouldn't limit yourself to one podiatrist. You should ask multiple podiatrists to see what they're like because everyone has a different perspective in, in things. And I think that would be a really key takeaway as a high school student who's really interested. So you can sort of get this idea if this is going to be the right profession moving forward when you when you go through your schooling. Diksha, do you have anything else? I was I was just going to say, uh, don't don't be afraid to when you're reaching out because, oh my gosh, it's it's strange, but I can told I can I can say with confidence that. Uh, podiatrists relatively are probably one of the most friendly, some of the most friendliest, nicest, supportive people for pre-meds. I, I don't, I don't know why it's just, I love it. Um, when I was looking for podiatrists to shadow, um, and every office I would call again, this was obviously pre COVID times, but every office I would call, they were so excited that there was there's uh, someone who wanted to come shadow and they were ready to talk about everything with me and they're very open and honest about anything. So um, don't worry about that. And we'll also also share, there's a website that normal, that will give you podiatrists in your area. So um, if you want to share that, Yona. Yeah. So that should help. Um, oh, okay. So in your opinion, what's the best decision you made for applications to med school? So Justine, what exactly do you mean by that? Duh. 
Justine. Sorry. Or we'll, we'll. What do you think helped you the oh. most? Okay, well, so for me, I, I, okay. Grades obviously are going to matter a lot because, so the reason being, I feel like maybe some people still don't know why grades are so important for medical school. I know it's irritating because it's stressful to get the perfect grades, but um, the reason why is only because you're showing the medical school that you can handle their curriculum. And it's a very serious thing because people think once I'm in medical school, it's done, right? I got everything I needed in life and uh, it'll be smooth sailing from here. And that's not true at all. Medical school is tough. And in order to conquer and be able to handle everything that comes your way, you need to have, you need to be able to handle a, a very, very strict, not strict schedule, but a very rigorous schedule of science classes, right? There's, it's no longer, oh, some of your classes are just, you're just reading for fun, or some of your classes are just analyzing a book. I mean, it's not like that anymore. Everything is science. And it's, it's one of your heavier, heavier schedules that you ever took in college or your heavier AP classes that you took in high school. It's like that, but all at once. And so that's why you not only are you proving to medical schools, but you're proving to yourself with your grades that you can handle it. Now, that doesn't mean that that's all that matters. So if you don't have, if you're not doing um, incredibly well, and it's not that you you can't handle it, it's just, you're just not doing well. I know that, that, that that's out there as well. Um, you don't have to stress about that, but there are multiple factors. If you're doing extracurricular activities, that shows again, oh, okay, that this person can do different things at once. Because medical school, you're not just going to be in classes. You're going to be in workshops. You're going to be taught different things on the side. Like, for example, if you're going to osteopathic medical school, you're going to be doing, you're going to have to go to OMM courses, right? So it's it's like that. For us, you're going to be, uh, you're going to have our supplemental courses are lower extremity courses. So you're going to be having to learn that on top of your regular courses. So that's why that's important. And also, I, I know you said the most important, but um, I, another thing for me is I went to a special master's program because uh, I, I thought that at that point that the best thing I could do for myself is to take medical school courses to show that I could handle medical school. I'm not saying that's for everyone. That's only if you feel like you need to bolster your application and you asked different medical schools if that's something that they would want to see. And that's the only reason I did it. I wouldn't have done it if no one had told me that it would help because it's also a lot of money. And so I, I don't want to tell you to do it if that doesn't make sense for your specific application. Okay. What would you guys say was the hardest part about getting into medical school? Yona? Um, the hardest part about getting into medical school would probably be trying to trying to gauge what it means to be a very competitive applicant. I think a lot of people go on SDN and read everyone's phenomenal stories of how they have a 520 and a 3.9 GPA. And I think you have to take that with a grain of salt because I, for one, fell into the trap thinking that I needed very high statistics and very high stats. And I, I mean, yes, you should shoot for the stars with your stats, but you also have to be realistic with what you have in front of you and what you're applying with. And honestly, you should be able to, you should just be able, be comfortable explaining your grades, explaining your MCAT score and being comfortable with the extracurriculars you've had You've accumulated because those things also you have to take into consideration because admissions look into that and that's really important during your application process as well so yes stats are really important but extracurriculars are really important as well and having a phenomenal personal statement where you individually have a unique experience really will sep se separate you from the rest of the competition when it when it comes down to applying to medical school i think that's what 
I would say was the hardest part for me when I was applying to medical school. Yeah, and an important thing to piggyback off of that is to know to know what you your personality is like and what you're interested in. Don't do something just because other medical students are doing it. I, I, if I could go back, that's one thing I would change. Okay, because you only you only go have college once in your life, and you want to you want to enjoy your time. At the end of the day, you will be a doctor, right? If that's something you're interested in, it's going to happen no matter what. Trust me on this. People, there will be people in your life who will say uh, there will be naysayers. Okay, whether they're your medical school advisors, or they're your family members or friends, don't listen to anyone. Okay, this is. What I like to call it is a mind game. This is all a mind game and people will try to pull you down, but don't, don't let that get to you and do what you want. Uh, my brother, um, my brother also applied to medical school and he's in medical school right now. He just got in and for him, I wish like, he's, he's so good at it. What he did throughout college was what he wanted. He liked business a lot. He has a very entrepreneurial mindset about everything. So for him, he would join courses on startups and he he created his own apps. And that was something he really liked to do. So what's important is think about how, when you're writing your application, think about how that can create, how you can create a personality in your essay, in your application. So that when, when someone's going to your application, they're not confused about who you are. They know exactly who, for example, who Michelle is, Shelly is. They go through it and they say, okay, so she did this extra cricket, that extra cricket, and I can see how this all ties together. And your personal statement is the best place to emphasize that as well. So that's something to keep in mind. Focus on what will get you to your destination, what will make you happy. For me, that was mental health. So I helped uh, create a mental health organization. And that was, that was my passion. Okay. Everyone has their own passion. Don't try to fit into someone else's shoes. Um, so what type of extracurriculars did you focus on your med school application? Uh, I think we got to speed it up a little bit. Yes. Yeah, um, so extracurriculars, I would say I was really passionate about, <laughs> um, a, my research that I was doing on cancer and plant microbiology. I think those were two key things. I think research is really, really fun if you're working well with a good team, with a good professor, and you can highlight some of your publications if you do decide to uh, publish with a professor. That I think that is really, really good and makes you really stand out. I also, the human side of me, was I created a cooking club for my school and I created that with a bunch of other students and I was cooking for a lot of first years and second years in college and showing them how to cook and how to meal prep for uh, for their college um, career. So I think showing two sides of yourself, one academic and one social, really uh, helps balance out what type of applicant you are as you're applying to med school. Yeah. And I I think I already explained. Um, I already explained my extracurriculars that that I really focused on. But of course, I did a few other things. I was part of a. Um, I was part of a, a mobile clinic, so that was something I really enjoyed doing. But again, that's because I liked it. And for research, um, what I was doing, I wouldn't say. Uh, all I can say is. You, you can choose. If the research is what you want to do, you can do a wet clinic or you don't need to, right? Uh, what I was doing was sort of a mix of both. And um, yeah, you can, if you want to do research, you don't have to necessarily work with, um, work with elect gel electrophoresis, for example, if you don't want to. So you can choose. So next question was, can you both share your experience in taking the MCAT and if your major prepared you for it? <laughs> uh, um, for me, I took the MCAT. I studied for the MCAT for a month and a half, two months, I believe. Don't do that. That's insane. Just just don't, don't do that. I, I don't recommend it. But 
I mean, it, it worked for me because I, I would study, I think, 10 hours a day, every day. And I, I, I felt at points where I burned out. But I mean, I, sh I got a great score from it. I, I, I mean, it, it kept me focused and it kept me drilled in on the goal of making sure I'm not taking this again. And I really need to do well on this, um, this horrible exam that we all have to take. Um, I think being a bio major, it did help at times because I think when you're going into the exam, you can't study for everything on that exam. It's virtually impossible. But when you start, when you're in that exam and you're in that moment, things start to come back from your memories, from the classes you take, you took your sophomore or junior year, it, it starts to come back. And so it's, it's nice that you should, you should be able to recall things as you're going through the MCAT, because again, like as much as I did the Kaplan, that's the set I did the Kaplan books. And I read all of them as much as I did that, there was no way I was going to memorize everything in two months. It's just, it's not possible. So I think just picking and choosing the week, the things that you're weak in, for me, it was physics and studying that and really getting through that will help you on the day of the exam because your strengths, you should just really be confident in your strengths as you're going to the MCAT. And it's all about men mentality as you're going, getting into this horrible exam. Um, I think that was my experience overall. Yeah, mentality, again, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to keep saying that mentality, mentality, mentality in undergrad. I mean, even in high school, throughout your education, it's it's about mentality. You just need to stay positive and take care of yourself. My experience was uh, I'd, <laughs> I, I, um, yeah, it's it was not my friend. The MCAT was not my friend. And I studied for months as well. I think I for me, I studied for three months each time I took the MCAT. And uh, it was just, uh, yeah, I never want to even look at that exam again, which I don't have to, which is nice. But um, I also took the Kaplan course. And um, I, I just say that for the MCAT, you, you, have to, you have to think about yourself and what you can handle. For me, um, things get to me emotionally. I can't handle just sitting in a room for hours on end and feeling the pressure. Some people, the pressure, for some people, the pressure helps. So <laughs> you just have to figure out what you're, what you're like. And I wouldn't suggest to, I wouldn't suggest studying for the MCAT while you're taking classes. So what I did was uh, I, I had one light, a very light, light semester or quarter. And during that time, was when I took the MCAT or when I studied. And another the other time that I took it, it was during the summer. And again, I tried not to take too many courses during that time. It just makes it a lot easier. And then I'd also say, again, for me, it helped to be volunteering at the same time because um, it, you have you have something that reminds you of your end goal, like something medical related, or even if you're just volunteering, it's um, it's good to have a balance when you're studying for the MCAT. And if a lot of you are in high school or in the beginning of college, I want you to start reading, please, please, because I don't know if it's still like this, but probably is. The cars section, the reading section tends to be the hardest for us as, um, as pre-meds because no one likes to focus on reading because we have so much science that we have to read, but please just do light reading um throughout your high school and college education it will it will benefit you on the mcat because it's all about reading and you need to be able to analyze okay um so to add which high school courses and college majors would help the most towards a medical career medical career i think uh, my sister is in high school and i help her a lot she's actually taking physio and pathology in high school which is ridiculous i don't know why they're taking physio and pathology in high school but i would say that would be helpful. And also she's taking human anatomy. So courses like that in high school, which I never knew existed, could be helpful for you guys. It's, it's insane to me. Um, and then for college major would help the most towards the medical career. I think, so no matter what your college major, I wish I chose business because at the end of the day, you just have to take your prerequisites to apply to medical school. So no matter what your major is, if you're a business major, you still have to take the same 
prerequisites as a bio major. The only thing with a bio major is, is that you're taking upper divs to complete your major for bio versus a business major. You're completing other upper divs for a business major. I wish I had that skill because I think business is really goes hand in hand in the healthcare field. And I wish I honestly did that. Um, and also my GPA would have been a little bit better, I think. Um, but yeah, I think no matter what, those prerequisite courses will help you prepare for uh, the MCAT and medical school. Yeah, so if you want something, you want to focus on doing well in your classes. And for that, it has to be something you're interested in. So do whatever the major is that will keep you happy and keep you focused on your end goal. Um, were there any specific studying techniques that helped you during medical school? Uh, big studying technique, time management. I would say that when you get your class load first day of school or orientation, sit down, prepare a schedule for yourself Monday through Sunday and write down uh, your class times, write down how much time you would probably dedicate to studying for those different ty types of classes and try to dedicate a day where you can at least have some fun, where you can watch Netflix, go out, uh, enjoy with friends. Uh, burnout is a real thing. You guys probably know as pre-meds, it's a real thing. But in medical school, it's it gets even worse because you're basically drinking out of a fire hose. That's an um, analogy that everyone gives us. But definitely time management is key and just setting up a schedule for yourself day in, day out, and following that strictly is really key to being successful as a student in medical school. Yeah, taking, and part of that, part of that strict schedule is being strict about self-care. So that means hanging out with the friends and talking to friends and making sure you're in touch with your family, with your loved ones, um, just doing whatever you like. For me, that's dancing. And so making sure I'm still doing that and working out. Um, you have to do that. You you really have to. Okay, can we count this as virtual shadowing? I think I think you'll have to ask the the people who are in charge. I'm I'm not sure if this would count. It, but you could definitely talk about it in your application and interview. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So I hope we hopefully we answered all your guys' questions. Feel free to message us and follow us on Instagram at the DPM Journey. And if you guys want to learn more about podiatry, we also make YouTube videos on the side at the DPM Journey. So it's really not that difficult. I can also type it in here. Yeah, we and talk a lot about podiatry. So we love anything podiatry, you want to know. Passionate about it. Yeah. Ask and if, us. Again, as high school, college students, ask us any questions.